Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's so good to see y'all. And uh, our, you notice something a little different up here. We, a little bit. Uh, we got Vacation Bible School. So uh, we got the, the theme is basically games. And um, working with that and the Jesus Saves and um, following Jesus changes everything. And we, we got where um, show me your ways, Lord, teach me your paths, all that going to the children and the theme being any kind of game you could imagine, we try to put it up here. So, except for some of those games y'all do that y'all shouldn't, you know, y'all know those things y'all be doing that ain't right. We didn't put those up, but uh, Vacation Bible School, if you are a teacher, be back here at 5.30 uh, tonight to be ready for that because we're kicking it at 6, 6 to 9, starting tonight, and that's through the 9th. I mean, through the 21st, I'm sorry. Um, we got, you know, it helps if y'all read with me so I don't mess it all up. Um, Brotherhood Breakfast is coming up July the 30th, 8 a.m. Lottie Moon International Missions, this is our opportunity to give to missions around the world. So we take that up during this time of year from July to December. Our goal is $1,500. And um, we've had school supplies. I don't know all the details on that one, though, but be looking for a list on the bulletin board and bring items by the 31st. And if you have any questions, Melissa Reynolds is taking care of that. If you are a visitor and we didn't mug you, we want to mug you with a mug. A coffee mug. That's uh, that's my joke that you came to Emmanuel Baptist Church and you got mugged. And uh, we were glad to do it. So thank you all for coming out. And I hope that all our visitors have been made to feel welcome and loved. Let me um, also got a card of thanks here from Miss Cecilia and Roger. We, uh, it says, thanks for all your prayers and cards and flowers. It's so nice to have a church family that really cares. It says, may God bless you and keep you all. Keep praying, for we uh, have a way to go yet. Always in our hearts and love. And, um, you know, Miss Cecilia lost her mother. And thank you all so much for your love and your kindness and your cards and your prayers for her. And that's true. I don't know. You know, in this world, you're going to go through bad stuff, whether you're a child of the king or not. I'd rather go through it with some people that love Jesus, some people that are on the same page and with a church family that cares about each other and checks on one another. So um, thank you for that card. All right, we went to Merge. And um, we took a bunch of guys with us, a bunch of young guys, and we went into Merge, and everybody did great and did well, except for this one guy was hard to deal with, and we had all kind of trouble out of him, but... But once we found a coffee pot, <laughs> then Mr. Coulson was fine. We, uh, <laughs> we were able to do. But other than him, let me tell you something. When you got a 1,000 kids and you're running around all over that place and you can't find a coffee maker anywhere, that ain't right. <laughs> that just is not right. So we, 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 next time we take taking one. We're taking our own for the safety of the children. It's, it's for the children. It really is. So uh, thank you, Josh, for going with me. Thank you all for sending these kids and being a part of it. And um, they learned, they grew, they had a good time. And we continue with that with Vacation Bible School, of course. But as we go on into our service, we want to start out with prayer. So I want to invite you to join me with prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for allowing the gathering of your people in this place. Father, we are of people that are scattered right now. Many of us, we ask for traveling mercies as they are on vacations and go in other places. Father, as we prepare for vacation Bible school, for every child that comes into this place, we want to make an impact on their soul in the name of Jesus. We want to see them grow to know you, to mature in you, to develop a relationship with you. God, we thank you so much for all the workers that put so much effort into this, for all the teachers that have stepped up. But right now, we have gathered together to sing your praises, to glorify your name, to lift you up. And we pray, Lord, that you are pleased with the worship that comes out of this place. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> We're not ready for us yet then. Don't you go 
church said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I was going to tell you that was a new praise song, but you figured that out, that it's different from the last few weeks. And most of y'all, how many people had heard that song before? Yeah, it's a very popular praise song, so you should have heard it. All right. Now, because of Vacation Bible School, sometimes we have to do little things different. I'm going to step down here because... Karen doesn't have, you know, the x-ray vision and can't see me through Mario over here. So Mario's, you know, he's doing his own little thing. So I'm going to step down here. Y'all know what I love to wear to the home
this morning, we do not have the scriptures on the screen because I was at Merge and I didn't get that taken care of. So Luke chapter 24 is where we're going to be. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I hope you do, Luke chapter 24, and we're going to focus on verse 32 as our main one, but we are going to stay in chapter 24. So if you've got your copy of God's Word, just keep it open to Luke 24, and I'll have you look there every once in a while. And what we're looking at is two guys are just walking along, arguing about the Bible, imagine that, and somebody comes up and starts explaining Scripture to them. Stand with me if you can and will for the reading of God's Word. We're looking at verse 32. So they said to each other, Weren't our hearts ablaze within us while we were talking, while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? Father God, we pray that the scriptures be explained to us this morning, that your words speak to our hearts, and our hearts be ablaze like these guys, and we will move forward knowing that it was good to be in your house. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Their hearts were ablaze when Jesus began to talk scripture with them. So when, when we see people who have truly encountered the Savior, when you see people that have truly come to salvation in Jesus Christ, just like Becky was talking about with that song a while ago, is in the lyrics, and you, she could see it on some of the faces, the people end up a lot of times when they do this, when they get saved, they have this burning, this desire, this fire within them. And, and it's usually when you first come to Christ. And then over time, it can kind of wane a little bit. It can kind of die down a little bit. But when you get into God's word more and more, and as you begin to study and to grow, and a fire should start to just build back up within you. The fact is that the, what ignites this fire is going to give you a desire to commune with Jesus more and the fire that's within you is going to give you a desire to study God's word more. These are two areas in your life that when you have this relationship with Jesus, that that's what it's going to lead to. Now, if you've gotten down a path where you've gotten away from those two things, then you're backslidden. You're going down a path you shouldn't go down, you shouldn't have been in to begin with. Many of people experience this desire, desire to commune with Jesus, this desire to learn from God's word. And the question is, do you still get that? Do you still have that fire, that passion that you had for God's word when you first came to know him? Do you still have that passion and desire to, to commune with Christ, to speak with him, to pray with him, spend time with him? There's a lot of aspects to the Christian life, but these are the two main things. The Word of God and prayer. That's what it comes down to. Where are you when it comes to this? And you, you, Some of us are stronger in one area than the other area, and that's fine. That's how we are. But when you commune with God, one of the best ways you can do that is through the Word of God. Folks, this is the way that our God decided to communicate with us. And so we honor his way of communication because it was his choosing, not ours. But what happened? What had been happening that very day? Jesus, had, he rose from the grave and there was a great deal of uncertainty and confusion. These, these men, these women, the, these people of Israel had just witnessed the crucifixion of the one that they believed to be the Messiah. And they killed him. And he is in the ground and he has been gone for three days. And they are walking along debating and talking about what the prophets had to say. What the scriptures had to say. What the word of God had to say. You look at verse 13. 13 through 16. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. All right. Giving you geography here. Verse 14. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. What had taken place? The crucifixion. Okay. Verse 15. And while they were discussing and arguing, because y'all know we can't talk about the Bible without arguing. 
And these are two friends. Of course, they're going to argue about it. Walking down the road arguing about everything. And Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. Verse 16, but they were prevented from recognizing him. All right. I think we also do this. I think we also do it. These men are walking along trying to find the answers. They have experienced something in life that they don't have the answers for, and it was dramatic. I mean, their beloved Jesus has been crucified. He's still there. As far as they know, he's still in the ground. They don't know. And they're looking and going, but didn't the prophet say? Didn't the prophet say that the Messiah would come and rule and reign? Didn't the prophet say? Doesn't the word of God say? And it, No, maybe it meant this. No, maybe it meant that. Maybe that was a prophecy for this. No, maybe it wasn't a prophecy at all. Maybe it was supposed to be metaphorical. Maybe it was supposed to be literal. Maybe it was supposed to, What was it supposed to be? I don't know. And the whole time they're arguing back and forth about the word of God, the answer is walking along with them. We do that. We want to sit there and, uh, what about this? What about that? And the answer is right here. His name is Jesus. Now, what's the question? Because he is the answer. And everything we come up to and we look at it in life, and the answer is going to be Jesus. And you say, all right, that's all well and good, but I got issues, and I got stuff that I'm dealing with in my life, and I don't see how this is relevant to me right now. I walked in here thinking that I'd get a word from the Lord about the issues I have and I'm going through, and I'm telling you, I don't care. What the issues are, I care that you understand Jesus is the answer to the issue. The, and I might say, I don't care. I do care what your issues are. It doesn't matter if it's this issue, this issue, this issue. We can argue about that all day. The answer is going to be Jesus Christ. At this point, Jesus enters the conversation. So now we look at verse 17, where we left off. Verse 17 says, Then he asked them, talking about Jesus, Jesus asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? Like he didn't know. But he's going to get them to think. And they stopped walking, and they looked discouraged. You don't lose sight. These guys are brokenhearted. And when you're brokenhearted, that does lead a lot of times to arguments and debates and questioning everything. When you're brokenhearted, you begin to question you might not want to say it out loud, but you know what's going on inside you. You're questioning God himself. And people say, oh, you should never question God. God knows you already are, y'all. And he's a big God. He can handle it. Okay? You get to the point these guys are broken. Their hearts are broken. They are discouraged. And it says it right there in the verse. They stopped walking, and they looked discouraged. Verse 18. The one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? And I, I imagine if he knew it was Jesus, he would have been such a smart aleck about it. He would have been a little gentler. That's bad when we ask a question and somebody's like, you don't know you're the only person? Verse 19, what things, Jesus asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people. In verse 20, and how you, our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. In verse 21, but we were hoping. That's where they are. Their hope has been taken away. When you have lost all hope, you tell me how well you do. We were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. And he told us he'd rise again. He told us he would be. And here we are on the third day. We've been dealing with this drama for three days. They have taken our hope. We have lost every bit of hope we had that the Redeemer of Israel had come. I saw him give sight to the blind. I saw him turn water into wine. I saw him walk on water. I saw him do all these things. I saw the demons bow before him. I saw him cast out unclean spirits. I saw him at the Mount of Transfiguration. I saw all this stuff. I said, this has got to be the Messiah. This has got to be our deliverer. And what did they do? They took him and they crucified him and he's gone and he took all the hope 
that we had for our families, for our homes, for our nation. And it was all just taken away. And here we are the third day. And you want to ask us what happened. What happened? What happened indeed? Their hope was gone. And then they had heard the prophecies. So they're really confused. That's why they're arguing about Bible. Because the prophet said he was supposed to do these things and he's dead. And then they heard from some eyewitnesses. The women. Look at verse 22 and 23. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb. And when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Now we don't know what to believe. I know what I saw. I saw him dead. I know what I saw. I saw the spear. I saw the, the water and the blood. I saw, I saw the crucifixion. I saw the death. I saw the burial. I saw the tomb. I saw the weeping. But I heard that he's alive. That's tough, isn't it? We, we like it when we see it and we experience it and we know it. And we can say, oh, I, you know, I'm going to you know, show me stuff. You know, all that stuff. i got to see it to believe it kind of thing. And that kind of helps our faith. And they had seen a lot of stuff, but now they're hearing. They're hearing from the witnesses. They're hearing from the women. And they tell us in, this, in verse 32, it says, So they said to each other, Weren't our hearts ablaze when while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? So they were broken. They had lost all hope. And as they're walking with this stranger... And he begins to teach and explain and go through. There's this fire that begins to just build in their hearts. The courage. When you lose hope, you lose courage. And the courage was building back up into these people. And as they're hearing him teach the scripture and tell them. And the burning within came when he explained the word of God to them. And it should do the same thing to you. If you are sitting under the word of God being explained and taught to you, it should ignite something in you because this is what does not come back void. This is what matters. My very first pastor, and I love him dearly. He was really great at keeping me out of trouble. I got saved when I was 21 years old, and I came to his church, and, oh, man, he was one of those fire, stomping, slobbering, hacking and sing while he preached, make you sick. And uh, he'd do all that, and the Lord said, and, uh, you know, all that. And I loved all that. But after about a few months, I was starving to death. I just was. Because you can only listen to salvation sermons so many times when you're saved. You know? And I want everybody to be saved, but some of you just need to get on, on the train with us and Understand, we got some teaching to do too because we got to make disciples out of people, and that brings us closer to Christ and brings salvation if you're confused about it. But my point is, he, would, he was great, he was wonderful, but I realized that he was all thunder and there was no lightning because there was no teaching of God's word. And then after he leaves, and we get another pastor, and he's an expository preacher, and he begins not, not to be confused with suppository, expository. <laughs> There's a Two different ball games right there. So expository when you're walking through explaining the text like we're and he got up and did that and he didn't hack, he didn't holler and stuff, but he had passion and everything. And man, something inside of me started to just blaze up and to grow. And I said, He's teaching the word of God, and I'm learning the word of God, and he's beginning to bring me through. That's what these guys were going through when Jesus, they don't know it's him, begins to explain the prophets, explain the word of God, and they just did not, the, a blaze within us begin to grow. And the emphasis being on the fact that the word of God has to be a huge part of who you are as a person of faith with Christ. You can't walk. The more I learn about it, the more I don't know anything. All right? And I learn, and I, I grow, and I mature, and then I go, well, I thought I knew that. And every time you think you can put God in that little box you've created, 
and God gets out of the box. And it's like, oh, no, no, you got to reevaluate it all again and start looking at it again. But the Word of God has to be a part of who you are because this is the ultimate way God has chosen to communicate to His children. Now, I know. I've had God speak to me in other ways. And we have reports from our missionaries. I'm going to go over here because our mission charge is over here. Our missionaries have reported that uh, in Muslim countries where the missionaries are not allowed to go in. Then Jesus is appearing to people in dreams and speaking to them. And other people hear from God in different ways. But the main way, when you say, I wish God would speak to me. Here you go. What more do you need? I got 66 books with your name on it. I got the amazement of a... All these thousands of years of collection and hundreds of years of prophecy and all this stuff from different authors, different time periods, different things pointing to Jesus Christ. The revelation of God himself. I can go out in the woods and see the revelation of God. You can go out in the woods and see the handiwork of God, but you will never know God by looking at a tree. Even though that tree is amazing. You can say, well, there is a God. Know which one it is. So, the Word of God has to be a part of us, and the main way that He talks to us is through the Scriptures. Look back at verse 25. So, Jesus said to them, They still don't know it's Him. How unwise and slow you are to believe in your hearts all that the prophets have spoken. Exclamation point. I didn't give that justice. I should have hollered it. I apologize. Well, there's an answer from a stranger. We're walking along. They already got smart with him. Now we're walking on, and he's, he's rebuking them. And Jesus is saying, you should have listened to the prophets. What are, what are you confused about, guys? The Word of God tells you right here. How many times when we go off into our own little things and we go off into sin or we go off into bad decisions or we go off in these other areas and then we come around and go, I wish God would just speak to me. And, tell, and God had already spoken to you and told you to not to. Don't do it. God has his reasons. And it's not that God is a killjoy. God's no fun. God doesn't want me to enjoy life. God, No, God wants you to understand within parameters some things are good and some things are going to hurt you and he loves you and he doesn't want to see his children hurt no more than you want to see your kid touching a hot stove. He's trying to protect you but you can't know that unless you go into God's word. And if you don't go into God's word or you rebel against it and say I don't care I'm going to do it anyway God I have to forgive me I don't think you fully understand how grace works. Because anybody that does has never said that in their lives. Let's just be blunt about that, okay? If you have ever said, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway, and God will have to forgive me, you don't understand grace. Unfairity, favor of God that we can do nothing to have, and then God gives us such forgiveness and such mercy and such love, and that how could we say, I'm just going to walk right through the blood of Jesus and do it anyway? You should have listened to the prophets, verse 25 says. I think about, y'all remember Thomas, one of the apostles? Thomas gets a bad rap. It's like the only thing we remember about Thomas is he did what? He doubted. Y'all, Thomas did all kinds of great stuff. But we just keep bringing, how y'all like that? For 2,000 years, we've been bringing up the worst thing about Thomas. At one point, Thomas said, let us go die with him. He was willing to die with him. But we just keep bringing up old Doubting Thomas. And they can't nobody say anything without going, well, he's just no Doubting Thomas. Poor Thomas up in heaven going, really? Come on, people. Has it not been long enough? But when Jesus showed up with Thomas, and Thomas said, I will not believe unless I see the scars in his hand and all this stuff. And, and, and Jesus shows up, and he's like, here, close your hand. You know, here you go. You know, here I am. You know, he didn't do that with these guys, though. He came to these guys, and they, they didn't 
have the opportunity to see the nail scars in the hands. They, they didn't have the opportunity. They weren't allowed to see the, 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 what the crown of thorns did and his, the piercings in his side and to know. No, what he did was he spoke to them through the scriptures. That's you and me. See, I've never seen the nail scarred hands. I've never seen all the stuff. But the Bible addresses this in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. Faith is going to come through the word of God. Hearing the word of God. Seeing these things transpire. And by faith, Jesus has prayed for us. The word of God speaks to us. And then therefore we can know him. The same way these guys did. They, they didn't know who he was. But the word of God is speaking to them. And they also revealed the fulfillment of prophecies. I, I love when you look at anything like in the book of Isaiah, 500 years before, he's prophesying about the things that the Messiah would have to go through. And Jesus went through it. That's amazing. There's no other book like this. Because this is not just some other book. Let's look at verse 26 and 27. Jesus said to them, in verse 26, didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? So this is what they didn't understand. Messiah had to suffer, and he's like, well, yeah, isn't that what the prophets said? Verse 27 then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So Jesus is questioning them and asking them, didn't the Messiah have to suffer all these things? And he walks them through from Moses all the way through all those prophets. Oh, lady, that would have been awesome. Just, just listen to that. And he goes through and people you got a problem with Jesus because that's what he did to get somebody's attention. He went through all through Moses, all through the prophets, all through the minor majors, everybody. He went through it, and every part of it, he's pointing out the Messiah had to come suffer and die before he could enter into glory. That was the big dispute because they thought the Messiah was going to ride in and conquer the Roman Empire and set up his kingdom and Jerusalem and kick those old nasty Romans out and start ruling like a king. But the prophets were not to be understood that way. They were to be understood that he had to come and he had to suffer and he had to die. And these things are coming from Isaiah chapter 53 that he's talking about. So if you desire to live a life pleasing to God, you and me, we've got to connect to this book. We've got to connect to these scriptures. If we're going to live rightly every day in the battle against the enemy that we are encountered in, you don't understand. If you are a child of the king, you are already in a battle, whether you feel like it or not. And if you don't think you're in the battle, you're already getting your tail kicked. All right? You're in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. Battle, And if you don't use the word of God in this battle, you've already lost. It requires a connection. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is your weapon. I got faith. That's great. I got salvation. I got my helmet. I got all this stuff. I got the breastplate of the brush. I got the shoes. I got everything else. But if you ain't got that sword, you're not repelling the enemy off of you. And so many of us are going around, I got that helmet of salvation. Well, great. What are you doing? Fight back. We got to quit running around getting whooped. We have a battle going on. And, that, and that's why Paul said, your wrestle is not with flesh and blood. And he starts talking about all these spiritual darkness enemies that you have and these powers of dominion and spiritual darkness, these evil spiritual things that your true enemy is. That's where your battle is. That's why we have no business in a fellowship of believers fighting with one another because Paul in the Bible was very clear that our enemy is not each other because we wrestle not with flesh and blood. If we get to that point, we've lost sight and you don't realize you're in a spiritual battle. And when we start fighting each other, there's a spiritual enemy 
behind every bit of that, and you're on the wrong side of it. Be very careful. So, there will be a desire to commune with him. Back to verse 32. So they said to each other, again, I'm just doing it again, doing it again. Weren't our hearts ablaze within us while he was talking to us on the road and explaining the scriptures? So these two points were intertwined. You cannot commune with the Savior without connecting to the scriptures. You know, I just, I just, I just want to talk to God and talk to God and talk to God, and that's good. How much God are you getting talked? Are you getting talked to by God? Is God talking to you? I'm trying to say. Are you spending? One of the best ways to pray is to take your Bible, open it up somewhere wherever you are. Now, be careful. Don't do this thing where you go, all right, well, God, what's the word? I, I got, I, one day I did that, and it was like, I will destroy you. You are my enemies. And all of a sudden, I was like, I don't even like that. I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to take a book, and I'm going to walk through it. That didn't work out with me. It's not a horoscope. It's the Bible. Okay? But say you're going to start in a book, you're going to go through a book, you're going to do the book of James, you're going to do one of the Gospels, just go through there, read a minute, read a little bit, talk to God about it, read a little bit, talk to God about it, read a little bit, talk to God about it. That's all you got to do. Sitting hard. There's no, there's no magic for it. And sometimes you say, well, I'm driving down the road and praying, I don't have time to read about it. That's fine too. But you need to find a place to get in. But find a way to let God speak to you and to you speak to God. One of the things I understood early on in ministry was that as the pastor, it was not only my job to be the voice of God through his word to you, the people, but also my job is to be the voice of the people to our God. I take that very seriously. So on your behalf, when I pray for you, I am trying to speak for you and asking God to work. I'm not up here bragging. I'm just telling you it's the job, okay? It's one of the things we have to do. So if there's something that concerns you, breaks your heart, you care about, I care about it too, and I'm going to take it to God. But in return, I'm going to take God's word and unapologetically bring it to you as well. Because that has to be part of this. There's, there's no watering down. There's no excuse being made. It is the word of God. So look at verse 28 and 29 again. I don't know, it feels like I'm being long. Y'all hang on with me. Be all right. Have vacation Bible school will wait. Verse 28. They came near the village where they were going. And he gave them the impression that he was going to go further. So it looked like he was going to keep walking. In verse 29, they urged him. Your version may say they begged him. They urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Such a blessing. They still don't recognize him. They just know, I love hearing him talk. I just want, I don't even want them to leave. Just to stay with us. We'll feed you. We'll say, we got a bed back here. Come on, just stay with us. It's getting dark. You don't want to keep on going. Y'all know how y'all are. Somebody at the house a little too long. Y'all ain't done nothing. You've been here. You ain't got no more chips. You've been drinking everything. Come on, it's time to hit the road. You don't know, your mama didn't tell you when to leave a house when you visited. They, did, they wanted him to stay and to fellowship and to be with it. They didn't want it to end. Have you ever been in one of those situations where you just, you don't want the fellowship to end. It's just so good, you know. I remember being a little boy on the back of my father's motorcycle and, and I'd be holding on. It wasn't safe. I mean, you know, I'm talking like I was little and my helmet was a little toy motorcycle, a uh, uh, football helmet from Walmart. So this was not good. But as I held on to the back of that guy and we boom, 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 going down the road, I can remember, I can still remember with my head pressed against him holding on for dear life because that bar was for sissies back there. It really, it, children didn't need safety, I don't know. But I'm holding on and I'm going, I hope this never ends because I just loved being with my father riding on the back of that motorcycle. It was the coolest thing in the world. And sometimes he put me on the gas tank and let me ride which I would never do with my children and um, all that stuff, but I never wanted it to end. Have you ever been in a situation where you just, I could do this forever, I don't want it in. When you've got that little baby in your arms, that newborn baby, and they're not crying, and they're just being sweet and 
perfect and you got that little child in your lap, when you're going through life or something, or you're getting into the Word of God and God begins to be so real to you, you can just reach out and touch Him and experience Him and feel Him and spend time with Him. You're like, I don't ever want this to go away. I'm a mountaintop experiences with God and don't ever want it to go away. And that's where they were. They were like, please don't go. Please stay with us. Teach us more. Show us more. Spend some more time with us. You can get that same thing with this book. There's a little girl in France who was, um, she had gone blind, and they had taught her, precious, precious child, and they had taught her to read Braille, and they got her the, the, the God, the, it wasn't like today where you can just get a whole Bible in Braille. She had the Gospel of Mark in Braille, and that was all she had. And she learned Braille, and she would read the Gospel of Mark, she would read it so much and she loved it so much that she lost all sensitivity and her fingers began to get calloused. So as a naive child, she, she couldn't read it anymore. She couldn't feel it. I don't know, it was like neuropathy in her hands and she couldn't feel it. So she took a knife and she cut the tips of her fingers and it just, the opposite happened. It ruined since there was nothing, she could feel nothing now, nothing. And she began to weep and she began to cry because she loved the gospel of Mark so much. Let me ask you, when was the last time you read the gospel of Mark? She loved the gospel of Mark so much and she couldn't feel it anymore. And she, could, and she, she knew that her days of reading her, God, her Bible were over and she went to kiss her Bible goodbye and she kissed the word of God realized that her lips were more sensitive than her fingertips had ever been. And she realized and she just all night pursed her lips against the word of God and was feeling the word of God on her lips and realized I can still read with tears coming down as she's still reading the word of God. We should all be ashamed of how we treat God's word when there are people like that that would give anything to be able to see, to be able to hold it. Do you understand? There were people that died to give it to us in a language that we could speak. We just throw them in the back seat of the car, leave them on the pew. I don't mean to get so personal, but it's the truth. Verse 30, it was as he reclined at the table with them and he took bread, talking about Jesus, and he took the bread, he blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then, verse 31, their eyes were opened and they recognized him but he disappeared from their sight. Now you, I just, I can't imagine. It wasn't though that he was, that they knew who he was. It was the word of God. So what about us? Where's Jesus in all this? What's that look like? Where's Jesus in these things? Are you communing with him? Are you praying? Are you reading the word? Are you feasting upon him? Where is your love? For, when was the last time your heart was ablaze with the things of God through the word of God and time with God? It, it, brother and sister, has it been too long? Is it time now to start to say, I'm going to surrender my life into that area. I'm going to get where I need to be. Heavenly Father, Forgive me, first of all, but restore unto me the joy of my salvation like you did David in the Old Testament so that I can again have that fire within me for your word and for time with you. Because here's the beautiful thing. God just wants to spend time with us. Father, Lord, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. And if it be your will to work in this invitation and draw hearts unto you, I pray that we respond and pray to you that you would bring that fire back. You would, Lord, restore the joy of our salvation, that you would commune with us. These altars are open. As they play, I just want to give you the opportunity. If you want to bow your heart before God, you can do that.